was a, an unsolved case for about three years until there was a DNA hit on him. He was a garbage collector. She was a single mother living at home. She had been a big fashion writer, comes from a big family uh, in, uh, in the United States, the Worthington family. And she used to live in Paris, and she used to write for W, and I think Vogue, uh, maybe Cosmopolitan, all of these fashion magazines. She was a writer. And then she decided to have a, a child, uh, and she moved to Truro which is in the jurisdiction of where this courthouse is, which is Barnstable. So anyway, mm -hmm. it was the fall of 2006. But while I was there, we had um, a problem. See, this is the, the Boston market. And in Boston, when, I, uh, when I, I covered a case in that general area, the Boston media broadcast insisted on sharing pool um, responsibility. So while we may go in as Court TV and set up with our, our equipment, like every six days, we got to run the camera because other TV stations said, you know, that, that's just the way they did things mm -hmm. there. Everywhere else, they usually just deferred to us and let us run things. But there was a problem uh, early on in the case, and one of the Boston cameramen, I think, shot a little bit of a juror or something, and, the and we showed the clip to the judge, as was our responsibility, uh, to see what he was going to do, what sanctions he would impose, whether it would be booting the camera or you know, just say, don't do it again, or whatever. And the sanction was, you, Boston Media, are not going to operate the camera anymore. Core TV is going to do it full time now, because they're the pros. This is all mm -hmm. they do. You yeah. know, uh, a lot of mistakes are made by cameramen who do just don't know the rules. To wit, what we just witnessed. Exactly. Somebody came in in the middle of a proceeding and started setting up a camera. You don't do that. You don't disrupt the courtroom. You have to get the court's permission. There's no absolute right to have a camera in there. There's a yeah, a little discrimination against electronic media, I think. Mm -hmm. You have a right to be there. It's a public courtroom. But whether you can set up equipment, you know, you got to do it under the court's rules. You can't disrupt the proceedings. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting <coughs> balance, the right to, in a way, have a, it's a newsworthy source. We want to be able to cover this. It's a, a right. We have a right to cover this. At the same time, like you said, you can't create a distraction. It's not about you in the courtroom. It's about what's happening in the proceedings. Right. It's, it's a balance of the First and Sixth Amendment. Exactly. The, first, the, the right to know under the First Amendment versus the right to a fair trial. And we've seen other judges, <laughs> I'm forgetting the case exactly, where it became the judge had a whole issue with the media, and the media was filing uh, separate motions against her. And I forgot, it was a case we just covered. I, I'm escaping my mind. But there was that whole issue with she didn't want media in the courtroom, and then the, the newspapers had to file, had their own lawyers filing motions to, against the own judge. So it was a whole issue. Well, I, think judge, right, I, think the Ray, I think it was the Ray Tenson case, actually. Well, a judge cannot ban the media. Yeah, I mean, these right. are the public courtrooms. I mean, right. We're not star chambers. Right. So the, me the question is, is it just you know, a notebook and, and a pen, or do you allow people to bang away in the computers? I was just talking to a prosecutor in the uh, Scott Peterson case last week, and she said that you know, the judge allowed laptops. This is 15 year, no, 13 years ago. But it, it was disruptive mm -hmm. to hear you know, the banging on the keyboard throughout this cavernous you know, public gallery. The courtroom sure. was pretty huge, and you know, acoustics aren't great in some courtrooms. So you know, at right. least a notebook and a pen. You yeah, should, you, gold you have a right to You have a right to be there. These are, these are open courtrooms, of unless course. a juvenile is on the stand, maybe it's family court, it's something like that, or undercover, maybe you seal the courtroom if an undercover is on the stand. Right. Well, while we actually have a break, uh, I don't know how it's going to probably resume any moment now, let's just talk a little bit about We're the case in, in general. Yeah. Uh, quick thoughts before the case goes, but what do you think about this case and the idea of the insanity defense? Well, I got to tell you, um, it's sort of a defense of last resort when you've got nothing else. When there's an insanity defense, a defendant is admitting he did the conduct. Mm -hmm. He or she did the conduct. It's just like, please don't label me a criminal. I did it, but I'm, I have a diseased mind. But the reality is uh, that defense doesn't prevail very often. You have to be so out there to not know right from wrong, that you have to think, and this is an example a lot of people give, you have to think that the gun in your hand is really a banana, or, or, or the banana in your hand is really a gun. I mean, you can't, you, you gotta be so divorced from reality. We, our prisons are full of mentally ill people, but they don't rise to the level of not knowing right from wrong. The exactly. mentally ill still know to evade law enforcement. They still take steps to cover their tracks, lie to authorities, whatever. Um, so I, I don't know that, that um, lawyer is going to prevail, but 
he's probably sick in the mind. Look, I mean, look at what he did. Yeah, Beth, you nailed it right on the head. My biggest issue the first time I heard about this case was the idea of creating those fake incendiary devices to keep the police at bay. You don't do that unless you understand that your actions Correct. are wrong and police would respond. Correct. And and like you said, you, you would really have to have a, uh, a warped perception of the reality. I mean, there was a case here in Massachusetts, uh, you might be familiar with it, Michael Muko McDermott, who shot and killed seven co-workers uh, yep. in Wakefield, Massachusetts, yes, December 26, 2000. He thought, he claimed that he traveled back in time to kill Hitler and the last six Nazis. I mean, that's pretty out there. And he was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Mako. So, Mako. Yeah, 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 so exactly. So you have a situation where even that didn't work. So every jury is different. But this doesn't seem to be holding up. I covered up. a case. I know we're looking at the monitor to make sure we don't miss anything. Yep. I covered a case in Ohio in, I don't really know when, in the 2000s, early 2000s. Uh, his name was Charles McCoy, the shooter. And he was the Ohio sniper shooter outside of Columbus. And he was, uh, you know, taking shots off of rail, rail I mean, uh, highway overpasses and j at cars. And he actually, you know, he, he hit a car and killed a woman, a passenger in a car. Everything else was attempted murders. And he was evading the police. He bought a gun lawfully, but he didn't. But he lied on the uh, the, the, the form because you, it's the the forms for um, you know the background checks, at least in Ohio, require self-reporting. And he said he had never been committed to a psychiatric institution, but he had. And he was a severe paranoid schizophrenic, Charles McCoy, and he was off his meds, and he was really bonkers. Mm -hmm. So. The, the jury hung. They, they hung. It was eight to four for conviction. Four people thought that he really was insane. He took a plea to about 28 years, and when he took the plea on a, I think it was a subsequent date, his attorney let me interview Charles McCoy in the courtroom before he was turned over to the custody of, you know, the state and going to state prison for right. almost three decades. Wow. I sat across from him and I talked to him. We aired it later. I wonder if I have a copy of that. He couldn't put a sentence together. Mm. He was so out there. I mean, obviously, oh, I shouldn't say obviously, probably off his meds, but I thought, wow, no wonder four jurors thought he was, um, you know, guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and still he's in prison. Totally bonkers. Then, yeah. then there was Andrea Yates, who also, I mean, I was at her second trial. She drowned five children, very severely mentally ill, first found guilty. It was reversed on appeal because of a major error by the state's forensic psychiatrist. And then she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. I was, I was there for that. She's been civilly committed for the rest of her life. And she really was sick. She thought she was getting messages mm -hmm. from the TV. I mean, wow. It doesn't. It doesn't succeed often. No, Andrew I. Andrew Yates I, is the only case I can think of. I think it's. I, I saw a statistic that it's like less than one percent that people actually enter that plea, and then only a quarter of that's actually successful to, to actually find a successful insanity plea. But I, I mean, is it possible you could have something where? Uh, jurors where he might be found, uh, lawyer might be found guilty of a lesser degree of murder, sentenced to prison, receive psychiatric treatment in prison, and then sure. eventually have a situation where he could be released? Is that, a, is that I think well, there was something with John DuPont where, um, you know, he was found, um, he, he was mentally ill, but he was sentenced to prison. He received psychiatric treatment. He died in prison, but the, the idea was he was actually, he could have been released earlier if he had survived. Yeah, I think that scenario is possible. Uh, the mental illness could mitigate down a degree, you know, mm -hmm. because you're mentally ill. You know, you still did it, but we'll give you a little break. Jurors can compromise all the time. Yeah. So, yes, I think that's possible that, say, in this case and others, it can mitigate down a degree, not get you civilly committed with a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict, uh, and then obviously it would be a it could be a parolable sentence, and all likelihood it would be a parolable sentence. So yeah, psychiatric care in prison, I think it's there on paper. I really don't know the quality of psychiatric care in prisons. Mm -hmm. I mean, our prisons are full of people who are mentally ill. Generally speaking, people who are of sound mind you know, are law abiding. You know, we we abide by our contract with our social contract, right? To Follow the rules, follow the laws, yeah. respect one another, respect the laws. Everything we do every day, we're following laws, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, the traffic uh, rules, uh, crossing the road or driving a car, you know, we obey the rules. And here, 
I just want your thoughts on this because what we heard this entire morning was the police interview of Adrian Loy right after this incident took place. And the major discussion was about the sexual assault, the alleged sexual assault that um, Lisa Trubnikova, who's the victim in this case, one of the victims, um, the deceased, that she committed upon him, that she somehow sexually assaulted him, although she never touched him in an intimate area. It was nothing like that. Even the police officer in the video said, this doesn't sound like a sexual assault to me. I'm waiting for you to tell me where the, it happens, but it doesn't sound like it. So this idea that he created, perhaps he created in his mind that he was sexually assaulted, does that somehow play into his notion of what was happening, what was not, is a little bit off? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm no psychiatrist, but I would say, yes, that is part of the, you know, b building the case that this man is of disease. If you're entering, all right, please. That whatever the touching was, I don't even know. I don't know yeah. the facts. I, you know, I will learn them shortly because I'm about to take over for you. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know what he says was a sexual assault. Um, but... I mean, it just that, that's part of the puzzle. That, that's part of putting it together so the jurors will see, oh, wow, this guy really is out there. Moreover, to defend against a sexual assault, you don't do it, you know, yeah. days, weeks, months, years later. I know. Thanks, Beth. Uh, you're going to be taking over soon, but we